All right. So today uh, in the Exit Your Way Business Roundtable, we're going to be talking a little bit more about adapting and retraining your workforce for a new world. Ben Baker is going to share some share some thoughts on onboarding and re-onboarding employees and, and how we're going to work through that. Um, and then we're going to allow plenty of time for people in the in the audience to to raise your hand. Um, we'll bring you up on stage. You can uh, add your your information, ask your questions, whatever we want to do there, and then uh, get your input. Because as as you all know, if you've been in this before. This is an opportunity for people to add to the discussion. This is not a, a one-way presentation. It's an interactive presentation, and we want to make sure that happens all the way through. Uh, on the stage with me, we got Ben Baker, who's going to be speaking here shortly. Uh, we got Andrew Cross from Eggs Your Way. Um, he's monitoring the chat, making sure that uh, I uh, keep on track and it helps us there. And Johnny's going to be watching the people. Johnny Kingman from Eggs Your Way is going to be watching the people, raising their hands. He's going to make sure they get on stage and, and all that good stuff and, and running the chat. So we do that. I'm going to get the chat pulled up so I can see what's happening. It's great to see all of you out here. Uh, I'm really, really, really grateful for for everyone. It's so awesome to be able to come into this thing and, and uh, you know, mingle a little bit before, talk after. Mm -hmm. uh, I see some of the great relationships that, that A, that I'm able to just develop in this and, and B, other people, I see them at the tables talking and, and that it's just really cool. Um, so glad to be able to facilitate this. Um, again, as, as we know, we started this thing out a while ago and we were talking about just survivability. And, and I think as we've evolved from you know, are we going to be able to survive? And it's still a question, honestly, for a lot of a lot of businesses, if they will be able to survive. Mm -hmm. uh, we've really transitioned down into some places are are actually starting to think about or are returning to work or uh, not to work. But as last week, we heard Bonnie Barcelos and Amelia Mendenhall uh, talking about the specific things that we need to consider when we're we're going back to to the workplace. Um, it's not a return to work. It's a return to the workplace because people are still working from home. A lot of them are okay. remote working and will continue to do so. So as we move through this process and now we see that that we are returning people to the workplace, uh, I think we're going to see a fair amount of people that may never return to the workplace. Mm -hmm. uh, I, when you look at some of the stuff that's come out in the last few days with Twitter saying that they're, they're going to allow people that want to work from home indefinitely to do that. And there's some companies obviously can't do that, but that's one of the, the real things that we're going to be dealing with is mm -hmm. the fact that we have people that will want to stay home now and work from there. Uh, we've proven that that in some situations there are, it's benefits to that, both for the company and the employee. Yep. And, and then how do you integrate that with your business? How do you integrate it from a collaborative sense? As we heard Bonnie talking about last week from uh, uh, Magnus and Clemensic in Seattle, an engineering firm, they want their people to return to work for the collaboration uh, and, and the mentoring that their younger uh, associates need as they, as they go through. This is, man, when you just think about it, it can be pretty daunting. Um, and I think overall in, in, in talking with the businesses that we do, it's, it's one of those things where you have to cover the basics as we talked about last week, get those down and then get your employees, your customers and everyone that's associated with your business up to speed as quickly as possible with the way that you're going to operate your business. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's really, I think the only thing you can do because nobody knows it all in this sense, in this time. I mean, you, you just look at um, yesterday and I'm going to share this briefly and we're going to go over to Ben. I, I was, I was Washington state is, is now going to go into phase two. I don't even know the exact date when they're going to do it. I think it's the end of this month or something. Um, 
but they just release the stuff that restaurants are going to have to do restaurants now i'm not talking anything else i'm just talking restaurants restaurants have to track every single employee they have to get their name phone number email time in time out that are coming in to dine you can only have one person that's close to the table or that sit the one person serving the table they have to be wearing a mask all of the people in the restaurant that are that are going to the restaurant are supposed to be wearing masks and everyone's supposed to be social distancing so I mean, I, I'm not even going to go into how many impossibilities that pulls up or creative solutions are going to need to happen to, to make just that one little thing happen. And, you know, in my conversations this week, I talked to a business that uh, and that they're talking about additional equipment, because what used to be something in in construction that was a heavy lift where you're going to have three, four or five people helping lift something, they're too close now. What are you going to do in that situation? And then you you think about it, one that we're probably all familiar with is is the meatpacking industry. I when I was young and still in school, I worked I actually did projects in a meatpacking plant. I mean, they literally are bumping hips in a lot of a lot of situations in those plants. How are they going to do what they need to do to keep people safe? And uh, and uh, you know, there's just so many of these challenges that we're going to have to do. That brings us to the next topic that we're talking about today is. How the heck do you get all these changes in the way that you do everything from we talked about last week to you know bathroom procedures to customer procedures to how do I how do I handle sick uh, when I don't feel well? How is somebody in my family doesn't feel well? How are we going to do when we need to lift something, work together? What just so many things. Um, and that's why we thought it was appropriate to have Ben talk today a bit more about re-onboarding and what that really means yeah. as we move forward in essentially a uh, drastically changing workplace. So Ben, I want to let you take the stage here, man, and uh, give us a bit more knowledge on that. And like I said before, if uh, you have questions, want to put some input, raise your hand. We'll, we'll get you on stage here in a few minutes and we can start running through that as we do. And I think that that adds a great flair to what we do. So did I miss anything, Andrew? You're, you keep me on track. Good. I'm good. Yeah. Just to, just for folks, uh, if you want to participate or jump into the discussion, have a question, just hit the Q and a and we'll pull you up. Um, we'd love to hear from you. That's, that's the goal. So Johnny, we got, we got everything from your end. Yeah, yeah, people are using the chat. Uh, the Q&A is a great spot for just those one-off questions. That way, they don't really, the, the questions don't get buried. They just remain up so we can circle back with those at the end. Good, yeah. good, good. All right. Well, Ben, without further ado, let's listen to what you have to say. I'm sure we're going to hear some good stuff. Oh, there you go. And, you know, first of all, thanks for having me, guys. It's, uh, I love coming to this thing week after week. You know, last week, there was, was some great conversations. I'm sure next week's going to be some great conversations. So I'm, I'm getting a, a lot out of this week in and week out. The first thing we need to realize is that we're going to make mistakes. We made mistakes sending people home. We're going to make mistakes bringing people back. The trick is how we pivot once we've made those mistakes. What are we going to learn from them? How are we going to adapt? How are we going to change things? And how are we going to communicate that change through the entire process? Because the trick for this whole thing with bringing people back to the office and adjusting to the new normal is going to be communication. Communication is critical. We need to think about the fact that, okay, 12, 16 weeks ago, the world was completely different. Everybody was in their cubicles. Everybody was doing their day-to-day -day routine. Everybody had uh, a way that they, they interacted with everybody, and it's changed. We forced people home. You know, you took millions of people across North America, hundreds of millions of people, billions of people across the world, and you just sent them home with no roadmap, you know, a wing and a prayer and hoping that it was going to work properly. And, you know, in a lot of respects, this has worked really well. In a lot of respects, it hasn't. You know, you have a lot of people sitting in 650 square feet where there's two people, three people, four people in a house, and it's absolutely not conducive to working. You know, and there's been a lot of stress. I mean, as the joke is going to be, there's going to be a lot of divorces and there's going to be a lot of babies made, you know, in the next nine months. Yeah. That's, that's reality. 
you know, yeah. and that's going to reflect back to business. You know, there's a lot of extra stress. There's been a lot of changes and some of those changes have been communicated well. And a lot of those changes have not been communicated well because like it or not, when we're that diversified, we've siloed ourselves. We're now not talking as easily to everybody within the company. We're talking to our teams and we tend to sit there and say, okay, I need to do these tasks on a daily basis. I'm going to get these tasks done because it's out of sight, out of mind. You're not having those conversations over coffee. You're not having those conversations in the lunchroom. You're not walking down to the show floor. You're not, you know, talking to people outside your department. You know, I was just talking to somebody who says you're not having, you know, uh, creative sessions with different, you know, different departments as much because it's been heads down. You know, people have just been heads down. We got to get to work. It's been crisis mode. We need to go from crisis mode, from sprint mode to marathon mode. And when we take ourselves out of that sprint mentality and put ourselves back into the marathon mentality, we're going to do much better as, as, as individuals, as companies, as organizations, as a country, because anybody can run 50 yards. Anybody can run a hundred yards. You may not run fast. It may not be pretty. You know, your technique may not be that great, but if you have to, you can move yourself a hundred yards down the down the track. Now, a marathon is a completely different thing. It takes a different muscle set of groups. It takes a different mentality. It takes a different thought process. And by do by thinking like a marathon, we need to think as says, what do we need to do to make sure that everybody's successful long term? What is the goal that we're all moving towards? What is the next set of goals for the company? What is the next set of goals for this team? What is the next set of goals for this individual? And how are we going to communicate this effectively? Because the the SOPs, the standing operating procedures, the you know the the policies, the culture, the you know just just the little nuances that make a company what it is, have had to change because innovation has been necessary, and pivot has been necessary, and change has been necessary. And we need to now codify what those changes have been because a lot of these things have happened on the fly. A lot of these things have not been written down. A lot of these things have not been, you know, understood why they're being done. We just have to get something done. So we do it. And, you know, that's been great for that sprint mentality because it's kept us alive as corporations, but we need to get beyond that alive survival mindset. I, I was having a conversation with somebody the other day and they were talking about, okay, people that survive COVID-19 and we, we need to get beyond survival. Survival means you just made it, you know, you're keeping your head above water. We need to get to the point where we're beyond surviving and we're thinking about what's next. What's the next set of goals? You know, we, we need to get out of that mentality of, of this has happened to us you know, oh my God, to, okay, this has happened to us. What have we learned from this? How are we better because of this? What new skills have we come up with? And how are we going to be better as an organization because of it? And that needs to be communicated. And that's what leadership is all about. We need to have more leaders in the company from the CEO all the way down to people that are now called managers, who I call, you know, uh, team leaders, because everybody in the company has to think about how are we going to make our team better moving forward? How are we going to give them the tools they need to be successful moving forward? And what's the story we need to tell everybody that they can internalize, they can codify, and they can retell that tells not only about where we were in 2019, what happened to us in 20, 2020, what we learned from it, how we're better because of it, and this is where we're going. Because if we can get that story into people's heads, they're gonna they're gonna align and people are gonna motivate and they're gonna want to move forward with you because they they understand the direction, they understand how they're part of the overall success. They understand the work that they did during this crisis actually mattered. And the and the the sacrifices that they did during these two, three, four, six months, whatever it's gonna be mattered and that they they helped keep the company alive and survive and they're going to be part of that company moving forward because of the work that they've done and the groundwork that they built to build the new normal of the company 
You know, we need to get there. We need to re onboard every single employee because where we were six months ago is not where we are today. We have dramatic change. You know, some of the changes are small, they're nuances. You know, we, we move right instead of we move left. You know, our customers have, you know, uh, bought, are buying this, more of this from us now instead of this from us now. But you could have brand new customers. You could have a brand new product line. You could have brand new procedures. You could have, you know, how we work from home. You know, what is, you know, what is the long-term expectations? If people are going to be working from home, this is what we need from you as an employee for you to work ho from home successfully. And we need to understand what does that employee need from us as a corporation for them to be successful and feel that they're still part of the team, even though they're not within our uh, location. Mm -hmm. We need to be thinking about all these things and we need to be codifying it and we need to be explaining it because people want to know the why. That, you know, it's not enough to give people says, here's the new procedure. You know, here's the new procedure for doing this. The question is why, what, what happened? What changed? Why have we moved from doing this to doing this? Well, we did this because we have to do this. Okay. That's great. But that was, we, we developed that procedure during the crisis mode. Does that still make sense? Maybe, maybe not. Yeah. And if it doesn't, okay, where do we go from here? And the more input we can have from the people within the organization to sit there and say, this is working, this isn't working, this is great, this is bad. You know, our customers are needing this from us. Our vendors are needing this from us. You know, this is the, the psychological change that has happened within this organization. Here's the cultural changes that have happened within the organization. And if everybody understands those things, you can start marching together forward in one direction. If everybody doesn't get that, if everybody isn't on the same page, if everybody doesn't have that same story to tell, then there's going to be disconnect and you're going to keep that silo mentality. And I was telling somebody the other day, silos co probably cost a company a million dollars a year in ineffectiveness yeah. because, you know, silo A has no idea what silo B is doing and they certainly don't know what silo C is doing. And if it, if it goes back to the point where everybody is, is worried about their own little fiefdom and they're not focused on the company objectives as a whole, they're not worried about the customer and the experience that they're providing the customer, then they're going to be ineffective. And all they're going to do is they're going to worry about their own little part of it. And that's where the disconnect and, the, and, and, and companies are going to break down. We need to be looking, focusing on the customer. We need to be focusing on purpose and the profit will come out of that. But if, if all we're focused on is the profit, the company's not going to survive. So yeah, yeah. these are some initial thoughts that I have. I mean, there, I'm sure there's a million million questions that people have, but I wanted to to take that as an initial thought and then grab people's questions from there. Yeah, I think there are a couple of things that I've been writing down while you're talking here, and I'm sure we're going to have others that have talked about this, but um, the alignment, I think, is, is one of the things that your onboarding or your re-onboarding really needs to do. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that, because you think about it and you go, okay, why have we done what we do? What the why behind what we're doing really engages your, your people top to bottom. Absolutely. Uh, the other thing that came, came through loud and clear to me was nobody knows everything. And this is a time when leadership needs to be um, admitting that first and foremost. Yep. We don't know everything, but we're going forward with the best information that we have. I mean, we heard that last week with Bonnie and, and uh, Amelia that, you know, nobody knows it all. You just have to get the information you can and try to go, go forward the best you can. So, and you have to admit those mistakes too. Yeah. Say, hey, listen, we made yeah. a mistake, but this is what we learned from it. How do we move forward together? How do we go? How do we pivot from this point? Yeah. So basically what you're, what you're saying now is that we really need to be, every single person in the company needs to go through some sort of retraining as, yeah. as we are returning to the workplace, but not only returning to the workplace, transitioning into, I wrote transitioning into the long term because you made another 
good point, I think, where you talked about um, we were in crisis mode. Mm -hmm. Now we're moving into more of a midterm mode, and then we're going to be into a long term mode after we figure more things out. And, and I think that's one of the things that that leaders are going to need to do at this point is saying, you know, and lay out these transition uh, transitionary steps that they're going to have to go through learning, figuring it out, you know, as, as they talk into the next six months to whatever it takes us to come back to some semblance of normalcy. Yeah. And this is going to change your brand too. This is going to, you know, this is going to also affect how you, how you're bringing this out internally is also going to affect how you communicate externally as well. You know, to be able to sit there and say, this is how our brand has changed and this is why we're going to serve you better as a as as a as a vendor because of what we've learned through this crisis yeah yeah and that's how you're going to build more loyal more value-based clientele by admitting that you know what we didn't know everything we tried things some worked some didn't work but this is what we learned from it and as an organization this is what we're committed to moving forward it's being able to you know show that vision yeah. And, and leadership is about admitting that you don't know everything, gathering information, assessing it, determining a, a way forward, moving forward. And then as things change again, reassessing it and, and rinse repeat. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and one word that comes to mind to me is humility. I mean, no, mm -hmm. hell, nobody knows really, you know, <laughs> what we don't. <laughs> this is throw it up we but we don't we're we gonna don't know. The way, we're going to drive it the way we think is the best now and then tomorrow it's going to change it, that's mm -hmm. the only thing you know it's going to change i mean when you look at the the just just uh, the acceleration of transformation of business with video and other things that have happened in the last two months is it's probably i was talking to somebody earlier it's probably decades of change or a decade of change that got compressed into into a, you know weeks uh, because of this thing. And that's the leadership is going to have that challenge to navigate going forward. Uh, no doubt about that. Well, the just look at, look at zoom. I mean, look at where zoom was 16 weeks ago as a company versus where they are today. Look at the technology. The technology has completely changed. It's now end to end 256 uh, bit encryption. You know, they put in a whole bunch of different security measures. They've, they've, they, what they've done is they actually realized, you know what? We screwed up when we built this thing because we didn't realize, you know, what it was going to need. And when it was tested, they stood up and they said, okay, we made mistakes. Here's how we're fixing it. Is it perfect? No. But you know what? It's a heck of a lot better than it was 16 weeks ago. And that's only because they were put into a crisis situation where they were, their feet were put to the fire. Yeah. Yeah, there's some good stuff going on in the chat now too. I see Dr. Aliyah brings up humility allows uh, allows us to receive feedback. And, yeah, and that's that's really I think what the leaders need to understand. And then uh, Khan uh, put in, you know, effective leaders are open to input from their people closest to the work. That's that's uh, I think across the board that business leaders are going to have to look at that uh, just because you know, I hey you you did change the procedure like this, but it's just not going to work because of this and that. And I think that's, that's pretty, uh, that's, that's pretty telling. So Johnny, do we have anybody that's uh, got their hand up? Let's get them yeah. up on the stage. Get some. Uh, we, got a, we got a good question here from Jason um, about HIPAA compliance. Oh yeah. yeah, let's oh, yeah. Bring Jason up, let him talk about it. Let's, All let's right. give this a try, man. I'm jacked about this. Let me see here. Um, Due to technical difficulties. Yeah. They're with us. We're figuring it out. You got the amateurs running the show this year. <laughs> yeah. the, monkeys are, the monkeys are running the, the circuits, are they? I think they, you go to the participants and then click on the little green guy and he'll come up. <laughs> the right of it. There, there we go. go. Boom. Got it. Yay. He's here. Look at this. Technology. Yeah. So um, we've had this situation now a couple of times with our company because we're in construction. So we're on construction sites and, you know, the reporting procedures and stuff for COVID are pretty, um, pretty strict, as you might imagine, for a construction site. So uh, one of the questions that's come up a lot and that we've had to sort of talk to our employees about is that, you know, you're supposed to maintain people's privacy and you can't basically say who got sick 
But at the same time, if, you know, Sally doesn't show up for work for two weeks, everybody knows that Sally's the one that got sick. And so everybody kind of talks about that. So I'm just curious how to, how to navigate that, you know, from a compliance issue. Uh, yeah. Good. I mean, my, and I'm, I'm certainly no HIPAA, you know, HIPAA, you know, aficionado. And I'll, and I'll, I'll say that right off the bat, off the bat, but you're never going to be able to stop the rumor mill ever. I mean, especially with something like this, when, when an employee's gone for two weeks, there's a pretty good idea that either, either, you know, they broke their arm on, on the, on the job site or, or they got sick in one way, shape or form. And people are, people are going to talk about it. Um, you know, I think that the, the conversation needs to be that, you know, people, people are gone because people are gone, you know, and, and, and it's, you know, they're, they're just, you know, for one reason or other, they're not, they're not feeling well. And, you know, we, we've, we've just, you know, we've had to, we've had to furlough them for one, one reason or another. And it's just, it's not avoiding the situation, but it's not giving any detail either. Um, because the problem is it, rumors kill. Rumor mills kill. And all of a sudden, every, if everybody panics and sit there and says, oh, my God, you know, where's Sally been? She's, you know, she's been gone for two weeks. And everybody goes, you know, am I am I going to be next? Is, you know, what's, you know, what's the next panic? It's, it's being able to alleviate that in such a way that, you know, you don't have the panic in, in the rumor mill going together, but without mentioning somebody in, in particular. And you know, you, Randy up here, um, he's done HIPAA consulting uh, and, and can maybe speak. So, so, so please, you know, step in Randy, cause you probably know, know a lot more about this than I do. Unfortunately, <laughs> um, you know, actually you're, you're spot on Ben. The, the key thing, Jason is unless you're going to run around your construction site and gag all of your people, you're going to, they're, they're going to speak. And sometimes, you know, I mean, you, you teach them correct principles, right? You teach them, okay, be careful, do it, you know, be, be cognizant of the fact that, you know, you, you might be aware that somebody so-and-so is sick or somebody is in here and they may have such and such a condition, but don't talk about that. And unless they're, unless it's a life threatening situation where you have to talk about it. Right. You know, from a HIPAA security and privacy perspective, you do everything you can to keep it private. But if there's an if there's an emergency situation and you need to communicate something, you do it. Mm -hmm. You don't put somebody's life on the line just because. Oh, I might <laughs> I might not be in compliance with that. You know, they have exceptions for all that. So just uh, you know, talk to your people and say, hey, you know, be cognizant of of what you're saying. And if somebody incidentally hears, you know. Joe Schmuckatelli is sick. They fell in, or, or is hurt. They fell and broke their leg, their ankle, or whatever. There's going to be incidental hearing, you know, that happen. I mean, you go into hospitals. I, I used to go and do risk analysis and, and risk assessments at hospitals, at clinics. I walk in, and uh, you know, the security officer takes me down a hall, and I overheard stuff all the time. I mean, yeah. it's not like they give you a pair of earplugs. Yeah, and, and and you're you know you go into silent mode. So just just be careful and 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 have them, you know, teach them what they you know to be cognizant of those things, and then they'll be okay. If they're blatantly going around and saying, "Hey, you know, so and so is here," and like they're posting it on social media and stuff like that, could be a big problem. Just yeah. like when when yeah. for example when Ben Roethlisberger was in the hospital and somebody you know nobody was supposed to know and somebody posted it and they got sued. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I mean, the big thing is, with, 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 um, the, uh, oh, go ahead. You know, it, it kind of trips over, you know, uh, overlaps into the privacy um, issues too. Which, you know, again, you know, back to what we were saying, nobody knows <laughs> what's going on right now too, because they're really testing these things. Uh -huh. You know, I mean, are we tracking people to find out if they've got it? Do we need to? You know, I, you know, liability-wise, the waivers are being done for people. Um, you know, uh, you can't sue companies now for making employees come back to work, you know, because otherwise, you you know, you're just going to not do it. Uh, I wonder if that, you know, Randy, too, kind of rolls into the HIPAA area. Well, uh, if you are. let me let me just say something right now. HIPAA and privacy and security are being killed right now. 
Yeah. I mean, they're, they're, I mean, you think about it. You've got all these. They're being broken. They're being broken. To, I mean, probably 5,000 times per second or 10,000 times per second. Every word I speak out yeah. of my mouth is being broken. And, and, and here's why I say that. you got all these doctors that are doing telehealth, telemedicine right now mm -hmm. to people at home. How many of those people at home have a secure system? I mean, they're calling them on the phone. They're Skyping with them. They're Zooming with them. You know, none of those things are going to meet HIPAA privacy and security requirements in any way, shape or form for the for the most part, unless they already had something set up. Yeah. And yeah. you don't have anybody, you know, you're not, you're going to you're not going to see the government sending people out to try to enforce that either. No. It's not it's not yeah. going to happen. I mean, I, internally, what we've tried to do and what I've instructed our team is like, look, you know, now is not the time to, you know, basically act in paranoia. Now is the time to act with empathy. If somebody gets sick, that's not something that they can help. You know, yeah. maybe it is, maybe it isn't, but we don't know and we can't sit back here and judge and, you know, try and, you know, assess their intentions. What the important thing is empathy, right? You know, if they're sick, they can't help it if yeah. they get sick. So let's be a company that cares for each other. Let's be a company that asks, mm -hmm. how are you doing? Hope you're feeling better. Is there anything that we can do? You know, yeah. That's what we've tried to say. And yeah. I and I honestly think that that's a good way of doing it is, is that we need to look at the why behind the what. You know, I, and I think that, you know, I, I think there's going to be a, a rewriting of a lot of stuff of the HIPAA and, and privacy and all that that are going to come out that are going to come out in, over the next five or 10 years. I mean, there's because of COVID-19. I mean, up in Canada, you know, it's interesting. Telemedicine is being done through a secure channel run by the government. Yeah, you you log in, you go yeah. log into a two fifty six you know k bit encrypted uh, you know, chat line, and that's that's the only way that you can get telemedicine done in Canada. Uh, but yeah, they, they don't have that here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, Not a long shot. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> difference in mentality. But it's you know, I I think that open and honest communication with our staff of just saying, look, guys, this is, these are the, these are the rules and this is the why behind the rules. And this is how we have, as a company have decided that we're going to enforce this. Hmm. And it, it's not a carrot and stick. It's just, you know, this is, this is how we're interpreting the guidelines and this is how we're going to act accordingly and how we're going to take care of our people. Yeah. And I like yeah. that attitude is this is how we're going to take care of our people through this. Yeah. Because you're right. People get sick. People get sick. If if somebody you know gets gets a cold or they get corona or they get you know AIDS or they get cancer, whatever, you know, it it's not their fault. Yeah, yeah. It, it it's not the disclosure, you know, of the you know the the, the fact that they're sick. That's the the pain behind it for yeah. the person. It's how the reaction is to it. Yeah. yeah. It, it all yeah. goes back to something you were saying before, Ben. It is is the communication. You taking care. You're taking care of your internal customers. You're taking care of your employees, of your colleagues. You take good care of them. You make sure there's good, proper communication. They understand the why behind what you're doing as an organization and what mm -hmm. their role is in that why. Have that you know. Have that defined and how they can help you to meet your why. And when you do that, you know they're they're gonna. And uh, turn around and they're going to take care of your customers. You, you take care of your internal customers. They're going to take mm -hmm. care of your external customers and your company's going to be okay. Mm -hmm. And it's going to thrive. Those, the, that, that, that's the thing. It's going to thrive because when pe people were going to know you, like you and trust you both internally and externally. Yeah. So we brought Dr. Leah onto the stage here. So he, he had something to say on it. So um, yeah. it's uh let's, let's hear your thoughts. A couple of things. Uh, first of all, Ben, you know, explaining the why behind the decision making. And you're right. It's not the care and the stick, but you want to ask your employees for buying in or plead with them. It's like we're all in this together. I, I, if I'm your leader, I need your help. We have to do this together because we're only as strong if we're, if, if we're united. If one or two of you object and are going to sabotage this other actively or passively behind the scenes, then it's, we're, we're all going to fall on our face. We need to be united. And I um, purpose. Absolutely, absolutely agree with that. Um, and, other, and the second thing has to do with Jason, when you talked about, you're totally right, Jason, about empathy. Here's what's unfortunate about human nature. When we're under tremendous stress, empathy goes out the window because mm -hmm. we're in survival mode. 
and and, yes. and and you're right we all need to be empathetic and be kind and loving to one another but when you're Ben, you called it a marathon. I'm going to step up a little bit more and say this is an ultra marathon that is going to last yeah. for months and months and months yeah. into 2021. Or longer. Uh, or longer. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Or longer. Yeah. An ultra marathon. Even regular marathoners that run, you know, 26 miles are not going to make it. So that's why we need everybody else. And truly for leadership, we need emotional intelligence. Like EQ will become even more important than anything else. Your yeah, IQ, yeah. it won't matter as much as your EQ, and that's what leaders have to focus on. You know, I'm gonna I'm gonna add on to that, Elia. I, I think that you know emotional intelligence focuses mostly on emotions, and I think there there needs to be even more than that. There needs to be needs intelligence because you you've got emotional needs, you've got physical needs, you've got mental needs, you've got spiritual needs. Leaders have to be aware of all of those areas of aspects of people's lives. If they're gonna, if they're really gonna be able to uh, get people to unite behind them and have the loyalty that they they need to have in order to be able to effectively execute through this process, I, I think if a leader is transparent and comes to his his or her employees and says, "I need your help. I can't do this without you." Yeah. We're all in it together, you know. Right now, we're just in survival mode. But we, how do we go from survival to to even thriving during this crisis? Nobody can do it by themselves. And to be vulnerable enough to say, I don't have all the answers. Like you guys have been saying, most of us don't know what's happening. Yeah, Yeah. We're guessing, we're taking educated guesses of how things are going to be. But do we know for a fact that we put this thing into practice? Not yet. (laughs) A lot of it comes down to trust. A lot of it comes down to building trust within the company. So people are willing to open up. And not get you know not get somebody yelling at them and say well that was a stupid you know comment you know people need to be able to you know say hey listen I've got an idea and have the idea be judged on its merit not on the person saying it right you're totally right yeah we brought a couple other people onto the stage and well Jason thanks a lot for coming up that was a great input there and Randy as well we're gonna drop you guys off we're gonna let JD yep. and and Am I saying it right in con? Is, is how do you say this? Yes, yes. Uh, Constantinos. Okay. <laughs> con is easier. <laughs> okay. See, I can say that easier than I can con. It's always, All right. it's always fun when I say, trust me, my name is con. Yeah, there, you go. <laughs> there you go. You need a t shirt that says that. That'd be great. Pro. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So. You had a couple good comments in there, and JD, you did as well. So I'm going to give you the two of you guys to go ahead and start off, uh, JD, and then we'll 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 move on to Con. Yeah, great conversation, folks. Um, and, and I think that we're kind of hearing this this new vocabulary being thrown around, especially the selling of empathy. Mm-hmm. And empathy for a long time has been one of the great traits of leadership, if not the most uh, desired quality of a leader today. But uh, empaths alike, it, it's almost like they're trying to pee on each other and mark territory is who's more empathic. Yeah. And, and I think that the proof is in the pudding, the proof is in the action. I I came upon um, uh, Fromm's uh, quote on humanization the other day, and it really stuck with me because I think that that's got to be the, the, the movement now is one toward uh, altruism mm-hmm. and solidarity. And I think that's uh, those are words that have been mentioned to a lesser extent in all of the press briefings. But uh, I mean, we're finding our way through this recovery period. I'm, I'm not even sure we're in the recovery period yet. I still yeah. think that we're in the thick we're of it, man. I, I don't see recovery we happening. This morning, I, I, you are in, in the area. area. Yeah, I, who the hell knows who's going to be you know, with us on the other side at this point? This could take dare I say, years. I mean, mm-hmm. and, and the reverb effect is going to be painful and may last the rest of the decade. So I, I think now is, you know, the, the, the shifting of the mindset, the, you know, how to lead in pandemic times, nobody's an expert. I think yeah. the, the learning has to come from people who are answering a call of leadership in some way and are, are kind of stepping up and showing the world how it's done and not just making the idle claim that they're impacts. Yeah. Yeah, that's great, great stuff. And it, it is, it is such. You you touched on it, and everybody touched. It, most people touched on it too. But nobody knows what the hell to do right now. 
I mean, but we're going to use our best that best guess and what we think is the right direction. And like you said, with the empathy behind it, but uh, there are people, as you said, too, that are trying to say, oh, I'm more empathetic than you and other, you know, but they, really you have to, you have to find what connects with your, your people, your customers, your, the, the people around you. Does anyone actually say that Damon, that I'm more empathetic than you? Does anyone actually say that those words? <laughs> I find that hard to believe. Yeah. There's, there's a song, there's a song out of the nineties that says my God's bigger than your God. <laughs> yeah, there wow. we go. But it's, but it is, as, as you said, JD, some people are, are using it that way. And, and uh, yeah. just, yeah, it's, it, it is interesting. Um, and and it, another thing you touched on too, JD, I think is very interesting for me is, you know, I'm sitting here in Washington and we are kind of supposedly on the backside with cases going down. And, and when we talked this morning, you said well, you're right in the thick of it there in the Midwest. We're stepping up, guys. We're about ready to overtake Queens. Cook County, <laughs> Illinois is the top uh, as, as the top leader as, as your as your board leader in case. <laughs> Yeah, these are not good stats to be proud yeah, of. Yeah, I know. It's, it's like, yeah, we don't want to be the leader, but but and so that is when you know I was I was thinking about this yesterday as I was preparing for it. Is I used to run a company that had east and west coast operations, and the differences between those operations is stark. It's, it's just in normal times, it's it's crazy. But when you add in something like this, what you do and the training that going back to Ben, the training that I do on the West coast or on one location is much different mm -hmm. than I have to do in others because mm -hmm. of the situation. Yeah. And, and, and leaders need to be thinking about that. The yeah. regional differences within the company or country differences. Yeah. You know, think of a country differences. Yeah. So Con, well, I'd love to hear what you had to say too. Yeah. Yeah. Con, what's you? Well, I, I kind of took a different uh, touch on this. Everybody's talking about how we're going through this and everything else. And what happens if people uh, have to leave work, for example, I think I believe Jason was bringing that up earlier. Um, my concern is that 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 we haven't said enough now on this side of what happens when people come back after COVID. You have yeah. a situation right now where there's reports, for example, out of China that were a couple of months ahead of us with that with with the wave and everything. People returning to work were treated like lepers, and you've got situations now where people were afraid to get to get close to them. So not only do you have to deal with the isolation when you're in the throes of the disease itself. But after that, you're isolated like, like like somebody who's spoiled and and tainted in some way that your coworkers don't want to even be around you at that point out of fear of what's yeah. going on. And how do we as leaders now impact that? How do we position that and, and almost present it in a different light? Because there have been on, on the other extreme uh, situations where we want to capitalize on people that have the antibodies that have mm -hmm. survived this effectively, that are not in immediate risk of, 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 of contracting the disease again, nor passing it on to somebody else. And are they the ones that will be able to kind of, you know, have that fireproof suit on that are going to go into the throes of things and, and kind of, you know, be able to take the coals out of the fire from that piece. Yeah. And that's just another thought to put out there because Again, as leaders, we hope to be two steps ahead as much as we can to kind of be asking those questions, even if we don't have the answers about what might be happening down the road about exploring those possibilities. Exactly. And Imagine you're, also going to, you're also going to be saying this is, OK, are certain people going to come back to work Tuesdays and Thursdays and other people are going to come back to Mondays and Wednesdays? You know, what is that going to do for teams? What is that going to do for morale? What's that going yeah. to do for, you know, for, for, uh, you know, effectiveness of communication and, 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 and projects and all that kind of stuff. We need to be thinking about, as you said, you know, it's, it's not just now. It, we need to be thinking six months, a year, two years, five years down the road. How do we reintegrate our people mm -hmm. and be able to take a look and say, what's the new normal going to be? And how do we make sure everybody feels safe and everybody feels welcome and everybody feels part of the team moving forward? And every business is going to have to do this their own way. Okay. And it, it's going to be based on your culture. It's going to be based on you know, the dynamics of your company. It's it's going to be based on your leadership. Yeah. yeah. Imagine the psychological, mental and emotional impact on somebody who's already gone through this battle, the physical battle of overcoming uh, COVID, and then they go back to work and they feel rejected. Imagine yeah. what that's going to do for them. Yeah. Oh, horrible. Yeah, yeah it's horrible. Like, like, like somebody years ago, you know, when people have HIV yeah. and, and right. people would learn about it, you know, where you could deal with something like that. 
Um, and still have that stigma of HIV in the office. Oh, yeah. There's, yeah, there's yeah. still, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. Really? Yeah. yeah. It's gonna be it's gonna be a real challenge there, and that's something, Con, that I, I hadn't thought about. But you're right, you know, there, there, yeah, it's like you, you're you're whatever, you know. It's uh, Jennifer in the chat brings up a really good part about too, as as uh, working parents, we've got uh, right, now. This is this is something that you know some of us are are fortunate enough. Our kids are older or not, or or, or don't have kids in some respects, but. Um, what are we going to do? You know, part of the workplace transformation is going to be what if childcare is not going, schools aren't opening, how are we going to have to, you know, there's going to be a lot of flexibility we've got to deal with too in these, these organizations to accommodate that. It's going to be. Yeah. And I, and I think, I mean, not every business is going to be able to do it, but I think yeah. that the larger organizations need to step up and start putting, start thinking about having childcare is part of their, you know, part of their company. I mean, yeah. when I used to work for Kinko's, um, I, I w managed the corporate for Western Canada. I used to fly down to head office all the time. And they had 200, they had a 200 seat daycare, everything from, you know, from newborns all the way up to grade six or grade seven or whatever they needed, you know, for the head office employees. Now, did they have that, you know, in the, in the 850 or 900 stores across Across North America and around the world, absolutely not. But they, but at least they had that at, at the head office ability. So, you know, companies are going to have to start thinking. Okay, it's not just our workers that we need to be thinking about. We need to be thinking of their families as well. Yeah. Hey, Jennifer. Hi. Yeah. I mean, that's the big thing is because my son's supposed to go to kindergarten, and now there's like confusion: is he going to go, or is he going to go two days a week and be home the other two days a week? Is he going to go for one week, have another week off, or is the daycare going to even open? Because my daughter goes to daycare, so it, it's just like it's just created this logistical nightmare. Like, I know I'm fortunate in that I do work from home and I can work from home and I have that flexibility, but not like you said, not every parent is going to have that. And so, you know, and then even if they do open their social distancing, you know, kindergartners trying to social distance, one year old trying to social distance. Like it's, I just, Grade I, seven's trying to social distance is impossible. I just don't see how, like, logistically, how it's going to work. And so I think even more parents may be considering homeschooling. And then, you know, so that brings in another, it, it's just, I think it's going to affect a, in a ripple way a lot more then we think just on site, it's gonna, it's yeah. gonna have this compounded effect. Yeah. So. yeah. And does, does that mean that one parent is going to be out of the workforce for four or five years? Right. You know, is this, you know, I mean, in our particular situation, we decided to, to have my wife stay home for the first four or five years that, that uh, our son was born, you know, for, for a lot of different reasons. And so she, you know, she was, she was out of the workforce. So that, you yeah. know, that, you have those situations as well. And then you have the stigma of once the kids are back at school, you've been out of the workforce for, mm -hmm. for five, four or five years and all the challenges that, that hit, proving that, you know, that you are worthy, quote unquote, you know, of, of those jobs because you've been, you've been away from work for four or five years, even though you've been working three times, you know, th you know, three times the amount of work, you know, yeah. as, as a mom doing all those type of things or a dad doing those sort of things at home. Yeah. So there's a, there's a lot there's a lot to consider, mm -hmm. you know, as we move forward about the dynamics of family, the, how how family dynamics you know integrate with work, you know, and how businesses need to sit there and say, okay, how do we help our how do we help our families that work for us be successful and enable us to be successful? And, and there's going to be lots some lot of conversations and a lot of trial and error that's going to come mm -hmm. out of that. Hey, ben, on, on that point, may I jump in for a second? Um, yes. I mean, when, when you look at the landscape of, of, of organizations, corporations, especially ones that have a significant enough size and population of their workforce, I mean, this there's a there's an enormous uh, um, change now in the landscape of HR consulting or HR professionals, and they're looking at how can they position their benefits very differently. Things that were important mm -hmm. three, four, five, six months ago from a benefit standpoint for yeah. employees. Is something very very different now yeah i mean now i mean i've seen it in the comments in the chat mental health now as a as an addition to, to physical health benefits is huge mm -hmm. now from that perspective mm -hmm. to jennifer's point if if an organization can offer some sort of coverage for childcare, would that make a big difference in attracting top talent 
huge and mm-hmm. keeping top talent. Correct. Yeah. Never, never mind attracting top talent. You as a you as an employee, if you know that your kids are safe and they're being taken care of and they're happy where they are, and you can you know you can pick them up at six o'clock and you're not having to leave the office at three thirty to to rush through rush hour to be able to pick up your kid, you know you're going to work a lot harder and you're going to be a lot more productive and you're yeah. going to be a lot happier at work, you know be, because you know your kids are safe and taken care of. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, this this has been a great conversation, and thank I, I thank everyone from coming up onto the stage. And it's it's this interaction is really what I enjoy about it. We're gonna drop the uh, the people that came up. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, we're gonna we gotta wrap things up because we do need to get done at 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 the top of the hour here. And uh, Johnny, awesome job, dude. This is working out. This is working. Good out. job, Johnny. We funneled, funneled. Yeah, it's, it's, um, and I we probably didn't even have enough bandwidth to get all the people up that um that wanted to speak, but uh, I think everyone's getting the hang of it. I'd encourage everyone to like email feedback or questions, you know. And if Andrew and Damon and myself can't answer, I know that Christopher Nesbitt um can can lend a hand. But uh, you know, there's only a second week using this platform, but I'm seeing. A lot of engagement, especially in the beginning at the at the tables. Yeah, you know, similar to a networking event um, where where you kind of you walk into the conference and you walk up to the table. Hey, what do you do? You know, it's uh, it's it's pretty cool. Wow, and uh, I didn't even look at the Q and A, but next week I will uh, I will do that. This is awesome. I, I will let uh, Andrew take us out here, but Ben. Thank you so much. Everyone else that got up and get your, shared your awesome information and and uh, just just so appreciative of this. But Ben, thanks a lot for joining us. Oh, thanks for having me. And I'm going to hang out for half an hour afterwards. So, you know, if anybody's got any questions or comments or, you know, tell me that I'm that I don't know what I'm talking about, you know, come come and see me. All right. All right. Good stuff. Well, Andrew, take us away. Yeah. Yeah. You know, closing up again and right on time. Uh, so uh, are we going to be going back, Damon, to the conference yeah, room for a few minutes after? Yeah, we're going to be back the conference that- room until 930. Yeah. So people can do that. Um, you know, we'll hope to see you there. That'd be great. Uh, next week. Thank you, Ben. Excellent uh, uh, interaction is what we really like to see. Uh, let's get people up and, and talking and engaging in it and got some People with great expertise in in uh, that in, in uh, consulting and HIPAA that brought a lot to the table. We appreciate it. Um, and next week, um, I did put into the the connection there. Um, Alan Zybert will be our speaker talking about emotional intelligence um, and being relevant. This is um, you know an interesting topic at these times, and this is stuff he works on. Um, I put up his LinkedIn profile there. Check it out um, and. Um, I hope that uh, we get to see you all again next week. Uh, looking forward to that. Yeah, one. Alana, Alana, is, and when he starts to talk about emotional emotional relevance, it's going to connect with a fair amount of you in the uh, that are here today. Um, and 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 uh, and it's really pretty interesting when you look at it at the the level that he does. So, uh, just thanks again, everyone, and uh, stick around, talk. Uh, and as Johnny said, send us questions. You know, you can always email message us. Uh, and the other thing is, too, future topics. If you see future topics, I saw one earlier about getting out of uh, the commercial lease from, I think it was Brad. I mean, that's something that we can, uh, you know, we can address those kind of things down the road here, too, as as we uh, as we do this. So thanks a lot. We're going to cool. get off the stage here and, and uh, let this thing continue. We'll see you next week.